Hey, Facebook Live, how are you doing out there in Facebook world? How you doing out there in Facebook land? I am Nathan Eckel. It's time to practice by design. I am a designer, not a doctor. And so uh, as I am stepping out into this space a little bit from a sustainability motivation and a sustainability perspective, uh, as I may have said last time, I'm kind of scared to death to talk about this stuff because I'm not uh, in I'm not in this day to day, but I am very close to people that were or are, and yet uh, being out of the space and having a systems perspective and a little bit of a theoretical leadership perspective. I'm seeing a lot of stuff, and I just want to be able to talk about that. And then what I'm doing is I'm going to uh, um, edit some of this stuff into a future higher caliber uh, podcast or something like that. There's a lot that needs to be said, and if nothing else, I'm a patient as well as uh, someone who is a designer um, and uh, I think for all of us, even even doctors are patients, even hospital administrators are patients. We're all first and foremost uh, patients at the end of the day. So I think it's real important to talk about some of these things. What I ask you to do is uh, a couple things. If this is unfamiliar to you, like it really was until recently for me, I ask you to feel free to uh, to contribute, but also do it from a mindful place because uh, what we're what I'm trying to do is see if we can't all just get along and what I'm going to do in this session is outline the four major groups in this whole healthcare system and uh, I'm going to basically have the uh, thesis that that I have here today is that the the two groups that are most in the thick of things, from a healthcare perspective, day to day, these two key groups need to decide to get along. And I'm seeing enough evidence out there. I mean, you can find evidence for whatever you want to see. But uh, among some of the tribe leaders, especially in the, I'll just say the medical space, and my heart is, and my bias, as you know, is, is medicine, uh, just because of my family, whatever. But I, I'm a little bit. I'm more than a little bit uh, 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 chagrined, uh, is a mild word, but I'm, I'm chagrined to see some medical leaders in the space who have tribes who have you know, really put out some, some very influential content. And I'm either, you know, I'm seeing just a lack of cooperation or collaborative spirit. And I just... They're not listening to me. I don't have the credentials or whatever, but I'm noticing a few things. And if if for nothing else, I want to be able to articulate and language these things publicly, because then what I do is I I download my audio and then I listen at triple speed to what I just said, and it helps me become a little bit more articulate for next time. And uh, I found a good thing for me to do is to type out a bunch of, Uh, Somebody like that, whoever you are, uh, blessings to you. (laughs) I'm glad glad this is resounding with somebody um, because we need this to get better. So uh, what what I found is a good thing is for me to try to uh, language what I just wrote down, and then I'm going to get to my central thesis here, which is that the physicians, and I'm including uh, providers, uh, so that's doctors, nurses, surgeons, and administrators, those, those people that nobody likes, they're, they're increasingly disliked more and more and more. People who are managing hospitals, billing departments, you know, not, nobody is a fan of that. Uh, one out of five American citizens is in medical collections. So that is, that is uh, I would say that is unconscionable. But as designers, when we peel back the layers of the onion and we chop right through the onion and we see that it's rotten all the way to the core, uh, I I would not say it's unconscionable because there's an alternative to this horrible lack of price transparency, which we have right now. And that is horrible. 
and that is unacceptable, but I'm not going to say it's unconscionable because there's an alternative. And the alternative to that is we just don't have hospitals anymore. All right. Uh, shut the whole thing down, bankrupt hospitals and no health care at all for anybody. From a financial perspective, and this is I'm going to talk about this in a future one because I'm still building a foundation here, but basically our hospitals are financially bleeding to death. And there are reasons for that, and I'm going to get into it in the future. And for that reason, I'm just zoom into the to the end of this thing as I kick my desk uh, right here. The choice is uh, continue the status quo. Uh, which is horrible, of a lack of transparency, which really affects people. You know, nobody wants their grandmother to go bankrupt because they didn't understand what they were being billed for. That is a very, very, very bad and very unacceptable problem, and I'm sure you agree with me. The alternative from a financial perspective for people that live in the real world and and have to pay their bills and, and, and really, you know, small businesses that can't raise capital. I mean, if we're looking at this from normal economic rules of the game is to shut the whole thing down. And obviously that's not going to happen, but I'm, I'm just framing this. Uh, or we bail it out, which is not really the normal rules uh, of things. I hope you're following that. So having said that, the people that choose to continue to try to lead or manage or administrate in a very difficult environment, I'm going, to ass- I'm going to assume noble intent. I'm going to believe that those people do not have an easy job and they could probably find a more lucrative place to work, uh, a more lucrative industry that doesn't have a break-even goal or maybe a 2% profit margin goal. That is not a very high ceiling, even in healthcare. I mean, you could, you could CEO a robotics surgery robotics company that probably has a much much higher profit margin than your average community hospital all right so that's my layman's perspective in a nutshell um there are four groups all right the patients which is you and me and everybody else the providers, those are the physicians, the nurses, the surgeons, the people in charge, those are the administrators, the CEOs, the CFOs, very unpopular people uh, in, in the ecosystem. And then I'm going to leave these people out because I think in many ways they're the most uh, easy to expose uh, uh, for reasons I'll talk about later, but the politicians, all right? It's easy to make really good promises. And we're seeing this right now. All right, it's easy and it's fun and it just feels good to promise, but how many of these people actually went to medical school and and really know what they're talking about? I don't know. I I don't know what I'm talking about. I didn't go to medical school, but you know what? I'm not a politician and I'm not running for office. And you know what? It's a good thing to run for office if you have good ideas and a good sound ethic and you're not going to make what I, what I will call irresponsible promises, okay? Now, right now we have this giant debate right now, healthcare, all right? Is it a human right or is it a privilege? That's the big thing and you probably have really strong feelings about that because you should. And you know what? Before we go into that, and we're not really going to go into that. I will say this, all right? There are a lot of doctors out there. I look at the doctors, and there are a lot of doctors that would probably say, you know what, it's, it's, you know, it's not a human right. They would have kind of the fiscally conservative thing that isn't very popular, and they'd say it's not a human right. But you know what? If you spent 10, 15 almost 20 years of your life in residency, in medical school, in a fellowship, maybe you became a surgeon and went into a secondary fellowship, and you're spending well over a decade, you're borrowing hundreds of thousands of dollars, you ha- you're you never going to catch up on sleep that you lost um, for the rest of your life, all right? And you might say, you know what, it's it's not a human right, you know? Uh, you might say that, but you know what, if if you care so much that you're going to work harder than I did, study harder than I did, get less sleep than I do, 
go farther into debt, you might as well believe it's a human right because you're putting in the work to figure out how this works for everybody. Really, what I'm doing right now, am I trying? Well, you say, are you fixing it, Nathan? No, I'm not fixing it. What are you doing right now, Nathan? I'm trying to frame the issue. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, to, to get past all the craziness in our culture right now and, and say, how can we best support the people that are in charge from the patient perspective, from a design perspective, from a sustainability perspective? All right. And we're being told if we're watching television news right now, whatever channel you pick, we're basically be tell, being told how to think. And, you know, if, if you're this kind of a person, you should vote this way or this way or you should think that way. And this is the implication, whatever. I want to cut through all of that. And just from a common sense perspective, I just want to support the people that are really in the arena. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm setting aside the politicians and I'm lumping in politicians, government, insurance, all, all of these into one, which is really a bad thing to do, but I'm, I just don't want to deal with that right now because it's such a, an easy target and also very, very complex. And I think the thing, the, the only thing that you need to know right now is, like I know, it's easy to make great promises. And it's another thing to figure out how to deliver without massively disrupting everything and deconstructing, ripping everything down. All right. Can we deliver something without ripping the existing thing entirely down for everybody? Uh, I, or can we innovate and give, uh, more out of a place of abundance, out of a place of surplus to other people, or do we not trust people to do that? And you know what, depending on what you've been through and, and what you've seen in life, uh, you know, we fall kind of on the one side or another. I'm trying to st straddle all of these things. All right. So that I'm going to just start reading my little thing that I wrote right now. And then I'm going to appeal to the doctors and the surgeons and the nurses, as well as on the one side and the administrators and the executives on the other side. And my appeal again is, can't we all just get along? And uh, for healthcare to work, those two groups are absolutely going to have to be uh, working together. I want to say, and this is almost unreasonable for me to even say, I, I think they should be in lockstep. Now that, you know, anybody that, that does <laughs> any work within like five miles of a hospital would say that is so... Uh, so ridiculous to even say that. I, I just think, you know, if we're going to solve the problem, uh, we've got to be unified about it. So uh, I, I'm, again, untangling this giant knot right here. So I'm just going to read through. I've said that 18 times. So uh, it's a perfect storm of health care. Somebody keeps liking what I'm saying. I just, I, I love this, whoever you are. <laughs> big, big appreciation. Hey, Amy. Hey, Fred. Good to see you. So we've, we've got a perfect storm. And you know what's fueling the perfect storm? It's experiences and emotions that we have. Because everybody watching this, whether you're on the replay right now or whether you're actually live, man, big emotions, big experiences, and, you know, valid. I mean, that it's a perfect storm. And everything else in our society right now, is polarized. Uh, people are being impeached right now. <laughs> I mean, it's like I can't even use analogies like civil war or whatever because it's like it's somebody tweeted about that, and you're going to think that I'm think talking about something else. No, I'm talking about the perfect storm. Uh, and if you remember the George Clooney movie about the perfect storm and the road wave and all that, it's kind of I think that's a safe analogy, a horrible, unsafely safe analogy. So we've all got to get along. There has to be cooperation. So if it takes little old me, a designer, not a doctor, talking about sustainability and trying to, from the bottom up, hit my drum of, uh, I can't even say hit my drum because somebody else is saying, you know, beating somebody like a drum. I can't even, I can't use any analogies without it looking political. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to beat this drum 
not of a person or an office, but to beat this drum of sustainability and humanizing one another as much as I possibly can. So my observations and values from last time, identifying the main group, I said it four times already, the patients, and we're all a patient, the providers, and that's the physicians, the nurses, the surgeons, the people in charge, the executives, the administrators, and then finally, uh, a, a bunch of other groups that I'm lumping into one, the politicians, some of whom make promises that we haven't figured out how to deliver. So Santa Claus promises, that's great. But do your, do your kids feel betrayed? Those of you that are not Jewish or you know Muslim or, or whatever, and you celebrate Christmas, all right? Have you ever thought, if I lie to my children and say Santa Claus is going to do this for you, at what point do they hear from their friend on the bus, Santa Claus isn't real, you don't believe in that, do you? It's your parents tricking you, and the kid's right, all right? And the cats in the cradle with their silver spoon, little boy blue, and the man on the moon, and, you know, we're going to get together sometime. Well, don't start it by lying to your kids about Santa Claus. And if you're a politician, I'm going to bring it back. If you're a politician and you have a real solid plan and it's going to involve raising people's taxes and Stephen Colbert asks you point blank, are you going to have to raise people? Say yes. All right, say yes. We'll respect you more. Just say yes. I believe everybody needs to have health care on some level. Say yes. We'll respect you more. We'll, we might even vote for you more. I don't, all right? So politicians like to make irresponsible promises. Now, if you're a physician politician and you, you don't have, like, racist ties uh, in your medical school yearbook, all right, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. If, if you don't have any nasty stuff like that and you refuse to step down from office— and you're a doctor and you're a good upstanding person, then, then you, and you're a politician, then you could probably be, make better promises. You know, you probably know what's going on a little bit more. But those are the four groups. And, and with politicians, I'm talking about um, also uh, uh, government, and I'm also talking insurance. So these third parties that just kind of get in between the relationship between patients and their physicians between patients and their hospitals, and, and hospitals especially in the community. I'm doing research. There are over 5,000 community hospitals. And you know what, folks? All of them are at risk because all of them, nearly all of them, are financially bleeding to death uh, for reasons I will talk about in another Facebook Live. Uh, why? Because I'm trying to get my way through here. So, those are the groups in modern healthcare. Um, I put them in there. Okay, you can read this. So um, the key groups, again, the, the providers, the physicians, the nurses, the surgeons, and the hospital administration. Um, now, I, I wrote here, and I'm not going to out anybody, but you know who you are, uh, parties out there. And, and the parties out there are far bigger than to ever come across my feed. But I'm, I'm really, uh, you, again, you know my bias is for physicians. You know I saw it up close and personal. I saw the, the study, you know, from the time I was in diapers, watching my father study to become a doctor and then become a doctor and then meeting him with my little toy. Um, I had this orange toy plastic horse named Freddy. And we lived in medical housing resident housing uh, about a third of a block from the hospital. So my dad would go in there in the 70s, and, and they didn't have time limits on residents in the 70s. So he'd do a, you know, work 110-hour week. And when dad would come home, I would do my little, my little orange plastic Freddy horse on our sidewalk, and I would meet my dad and uh, probably motivated my dad a lot because I was the oldest and I was the only child at that point. And then we would walk home together, which probably took all of two minutes. Uh, so my bias is for physicians. Just know that. But I'm disappointed because I'm seeing uh, these insider whistleblower. I can't even say the word whistleblower because you think it's polarized uh, there because it, it is polarized, but not in exactly the way that you're thinking it's polarized because of the events of the last week. 
but there are whistleblower books about one aspect of the dysfunction of healthcare. All right. So this is where my sustainability design piece hits in because it's like the beach ball. The beach ball has four different colors. My, my friend Scott Fay taught me about the beach ball. It's like that old story about, you know, the old wise blind men. Now that's politically incorrect, but these four blind men and the elephant, and they're all petting the elephant and they have different parts of the elephant. So they think that it's a different thing and it's really all one thing. It's the elephant. So the beach ball. You know, you see the green side of the beach ball, so you think the solution is green. I see the blue side, so I think it's blue. Somebody else sees the yellow side. Somebody else thinks sees the uh, the red side. All right. So when a physician writes a book and says this is the problem, and they just pick one problem and they kind of side seemingly with one group because they leave a giant piece out. They, they leave the central piece. I read a book uh, recently, and the word reimbursements is not even in the index of the book. I couldn't believe it because it's all about, you know, how patients are being ripped off and all of this stuff. And you know what? It's true. Patients are suffering, and they shouldn't suffer. It's not right that they suffer. So I, I agree with that part. But the cause, if you're, if you're working in a hospital— if you're employed by a hospital, surely you know that hospitals are financially bleeding to death, and much of that bleeding is due to outside interference. Now, I'm not going to get into any more detail than that because I don't want to open that up. But, you know, think of your job. Think of your paycheck. Those of you that are not entrepreneurs, at the end of the week, all right, you get a pay stub. It's auto-deposited, of course. It's emailed to you. But the old days when you had a pay stub, all right, when I used to be a temp and I would uh, get my pay stub at, you know, working at the, at the Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper, all right, for eight fifty an hour or whatever I made, you know, after I got out of college and I'm just temping, all right? And I had the end of the week... And they took all the other, you know, the benefits out of my paycheck and all of that. Imagine getting capped and saying, you know what? You're not going to make more than $8.50 an hour in the year 1998 or whatever it is. Imagine having a cap. That's what happens to hospital. That's, what they, they, that's why they're bleeding to death. And it gets way worse than there. What I tell you in the future, you're not going to believe. So writing a book that leaves that piece out and just kind of almost panders to one group at the expense of all the things that are going in, not good. All right, I'm moving on. I'm also, as I say here, there are tribe leaders in healthcare, specifically in medicine, and I won't mention their name um, right now. I pay them money. I am a supporter because I want to be part of the tribe, and I, I there's a, a vision for a uh, kind of a 3.0 version of healthcare, in which this is really what I'm talking about right now, which people are working together, and you know when uh, when when bad things happen to patients, you know patients get compensated appropriately, and and you know people are not getting burnt out as much, and nobody gets absolutely everything that they want, but by and large, it's a much fairer, more sustainable system. So I am a supporter. I still am a supporter, but I'm seeing all kinds of kind of, you know, raging and going off the handle and uh, almost whininess. All right. And that sounds kind of mean, but I mean, it's uh, this, uh, it, it does sound kind of mean, but I, I think that with, with thousands and thousands of people supporting you, um, you know, it, you can, you can kind of write your own ticket. You're not working, hopefully not working hundred hour weeks in the hospital <laughs> if you've got all of this stuff going. And again, it's a real short sightedness. It's a real short sightedness. So maybe, maybe they don't have the benefit of design thinking of sustainability systems thinking again, not trying to be too mean about it, but I, I just see a so short sightedness. And again, that fuels my central thesis for the physicians watching this. All right. Administrators, they could be doing something else. I know you don't think so. 
I know you don't think that the people that are in kind of a bureaucratic bureaucracy, you know, whether it's government or whether it's private in, in healthcare or whatever, I know you see the, the downside and the shortcomings of that, but it's not an easy job. Here's my question. All right. I, I guess this is a point right now. This is a big point. Here's my question. All right. What if they all quit? What if, what if all the leaders of all the hospitals quit? What if all the MBAs that are running hospitals or, or people that may not have MBAs, but they have business training or they have some kind of executive or administrative, what if the billing people quit? What if the, the CFO quit? What if the CEO quit? What would happen? Well, we'd have a giant vacuum. We'd have a giant vacuum. And did I mention assume noble intent? That's one of the central things that I'm trying to remember here. So assume noble intent with the people that are managing or leading these institutions, because they could be doing an easier job somewhere else, I'm sure. What if everybody quit? All right. Well, again, a vacuum. What if who would step up? Would the physician step up and start leading the hospital? Most of them probably wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, you, you want to talk about burnout. I mean, my gosh. But you know what? There, there are several uh, MDs who have MBAs, so they could do that. You know, And then what would they find once they start taking the reins of the hospital? They would find, if they're not already acutely aware, which, which they are, they've got this horrible, horrible, uh, I want to call it a sucker's choice, but when we call it a sucker's a lose-lose choice, when it's because of your mindset being wrong and the choice is lose versus lose, then that's a sucker's choice because it's really in your mind. Uh, there's, the, there's a solution, but you got to get your mindset right. I don't know that you can do that when you are running a hospital and your choice is, okay, we're bleeding because we've, we've got our reimbursements capped and delayed probably, and then we're only getting a percentage of the cap. It was bad enough they capped us, but now we're only getting a, 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 a portion of that, and it's because the, the, the way that the government set this system up, uh, they used the languaging and they went to patients and they, they said, rate and review us, take this survey, and in a rate and review culture, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm going to talk more about this, and this is really why I'm outraged once I found this out. Review, here's a survey of how the hospital did. What did you think? You know? And really, what, what the government is trying to do is, is give, make the patient the auditor with this report. It's actually an assessment. It says so in the acronym uh, for the reimbursement acronym that I'm not even going to go into uh, right now. It's called HCAPS. The A is for assessment, but it's called, I don't know why, a survey. What are we going to think when we fill out a survey? Is that objective or does that scream subjectivity? Does that scream rate and review? Does that scream foodie? Oh my gosh. And, and this is why, my friends, hospitals are bleeding to death, all right? It's because we're rating and reviewing them in, in some cases, in many cases, probably in most cases. And then when, the, when the, the, the leadership vacuum develops, when physicians or other people, you know, take the reins, if they should, this is my hypothetical situation, what, what if all the administrators quit? Who would step up? Maybe it would be the physicians. Maybe it would be other people. What would they find? Lose. Price, lack of price transparency to compensate for this unpredictability of the reimbursements we have, which is horrible, horrible. Or what could we do? We could just shut the whole thing down. That happened here in Philadelphia, 30 miles away from where I sit right now. Hashtag save Hahnemann. This is what happened. The, the hospital went out of business. I've heard tales of other hospitals going out of business. I have a family member whose hospital almost went out of business recently. This really happens. Now, if you are in a, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it, all right, I'm going to call it a medically privileged area, like the Philadelphia area, where we have probably a dozen or more hospitals 
for millions of people. That's not a ton of hospitals. That's a lot of hospitals. All right. It's one thing. And it was very, very horrible what happened. It was very disruptive. It was painful financially and in every other way for people that had to redo their schedules and their logistics and these residents that were absolutely shocked. But you know what? It got, at the end of the day, it's been more or less absorbed with a high level of disruption and massive beyond inconvenience. And it's unacceptable what happened. But you know what? If you're in a rural area and your town loses their hospital, that's not cool because then you get to drive another hour past the hospital in your little town that shut, and now you can go to the next t- city over. Um, I did this with my great uncle, my great uncle Tom, uh, when I would take him to the VA, and we didn't have a VA in our little town in in central Pennsylvania. We we had to go to northeast Pennsylvania, and and so I drove my uncle Tom up there. I was happy to do so, but it was I mean, man, it was it was a whole day. Of, of work and time. And that's, that's what we're looking at. Uh, so it's an awful, awful choice. So it's for that reason. It's taken me a while to get here. It's for that reason that I say to physicians, please don't gang up on the administrators. I know, I know there are bad things that happen. I know there's, a, there, there's uh, to call it a lack of trust mutually, between the groups is uh, woefully inadequate. It's the situation's far worse than that. There are reasons. There are justifiable reasons. Um, we've got to decide to work together. So if I can, with my little perspective on healthcare from a sustainability systems, 360 degree view will help maybe do that. Uh, then that's cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're looking at here. So it's pretty, you know, it's dire. And at the same time, if we work together, we can find some solutions. Now in future episodes, I'm going to go more in depth and maybe I should do this more on a daily basis until I run out of brain cells here. Uh, maybe on my next one, I will talk about the HCAPS reimbursement system. And how the the po- political wing of the four, the politicians, the uh, government, the bureaucrats, and then the insurance companies, and I'm I won't even get into the insurance, but that whole thing in the system that they have set up has made it very, 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 uh, very difficult. And imagine to make it personal, because I do want to make it personal. Imagine your paycheck and your pay stub, and then being capped, and then. Uh, only being paid a portion of what you are entitled to. That is the situation for hospitals right now. Nobody wants to defend a hospital. I'm not defending a hospital. I'm just saying this is a really bad situation, and we as patients have dealt this unknowingly because of our own uh, collective uh, ignorance in many cases. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about it as nicely as I can because I don't want to be, you know, blaming and pointing fingers. I'm going to, uh, if you have ears, let let them hear. And I'm going to explain some of this, my understanding of it, that practicing physicians and, and now I'm reaching out to hospital administrators and deputy administrators and people like that to help me better understand these things. And they're saying, yes, Nathan, that's what we're dealing with. So I'm going to talk about that in a future episode, and I will also talk about politicians, and I really want to investigate this idea. You know, we all want universal, we all want to believe that it's a human right. Um, We haven't figured out how to actually deliver on that promise without massively disrupting and possibly destroying the infrastructure that we have. So I want to investigate that very carefully and gingerly. And uh, I I just think about, you know, the Santa Claus analogy. I I, I think about the time that Michael Scott uh, in the office made some promises that he couldn't deliver on. And and it felt great at the moment, but he disappointed a lot of people. So we're going to talk about that in a future episode. So thanks for watching this. I think I'm going to maybe go back on um, maybe privately and summarize what I said here. And then we're going to move on. 
Nathan Eckel here. This has been practice by design. And, uh, you know, again, please uh, feel free to comment and contribute from your perspective. Uh, caveats, number one, be honorable and respectful and believe the best about other people unless you have absolute proof for uh, for uh, asserting otherwise, and, and there can be proof out there. Number two, uh, this is important also. I'm talking about traditional medicine here, so I'm not I'm not talking outside. You know, tradi- I'm talking about traditional. Somebody loved that I said that. I, I love I love seeing uh, what what people are reacting at the times that they react. It's so funny. So. I'm talking about traditional medicine. Somebody else is talking about alternative medicine right now. And, and I mean, there's probably uh, more tolerance there for whatever opinions are at. I want to go after, tra- not go after, but I want to, I want to go uh, and, and talk to the traditions of traditional medicine because some of those traditions need to change and we have to respect some of the values of traditional medicine and why it is the way that it is. And I, I believe that I'm somewhat within those bounds. And, and it's because I want influence with the influencers of traditional medicine who have spent decades getting better grades than me and paying more money and borrowing more money and paying the money back and sleeping less than me. And if I want to influence those people, I need to show respect and a a degree of deference for their accomplishments. All right. uh, See everybody on the next one. Um, uh, uh, Hey, I hope you like my backdrop. Looking looking okay, or should I put my (laughs) green screen back up or put my little logos back up? Uh, Love to hear what you think about the backdrop. (laughs) I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.